I'm delighted to be able to introduce you uh, to Associate Professor Chin Yi Lo uh, from the National Institute of Education at Nanyang Technological University. I've known Chin Yi now for probably four or five years. Uh, we've met through the United Kingdom Literacy Association, and I knew of her work before. She's a very talented academic uh, and an ex-teacher uh, uh, working with pre-service, in-service uh, and postgraduate uh, courses on literature education, on reading and school libraries at NIE, uh, the National Institute of Education there. She's very involved, uh, not only on the ground uh, in terms of supporting uh, colleagues in various ways, but also uh, in government contexts, as it were, a very influential uh, figure in her own space uh, and a really committed uh, academic trying to understand teenagers and younger people's uh, understandings and perceptions of reading and reading for pleasure, uh, and indeed why school libraries matter and why librarians matter. As you'll find out, she's got a very engaging manner and will be sharing with us some of her research and insights this afternoon. And we're just delighted you could join us, Ginny. Thank you for doing so. I want, want to point out to those folks present who've joined us, all 108 of you, that for Ginny, it's 10 o'clock at night. And so the lecture will end at around 11. And then she's committed to joining a smaller group of associate members of the Literacy and Social Justice Centre um, for a discussion afterwards, which I think uh, has in, an indication of the kind of colleague we're dealing with. So over to you, Chinyi. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you for just such a kind introduction. And I just want to say that all that talk about the weather has reminded me so much of England. I did my master's in Nottingham in literary linguistics, actually. And I remember a friend from Singapore came up to visit me and we took uh, the train up to Edinburgh and then we drove. We took up, we rented a car and then we drove and midway through the trip, she's like, why are you talking to everybody about the weather? You know, do you have to walk into the shop and ask them about the weather? Do you have to like go every? I'm like, I'm so sorry. That's what they do here. So I think it really, I have to start with the weather here. It is raining in Singapore too, but it is 27 degrees and it was storming. And the rain in Singapore is very different from the rain in the UK, as I found out from studying there. It's kind of wet and muddy over here. It's kind of cold and dreary over in the UK. You feel kind of sad. Um, it lasts for a very long time in the UK down here. It tends to storm, but after a while it stops. So that's kind of the difference. And that's a little bit about Singapore. And today I'm going to talk about why school libraries and librarians matter. And I thought it might be good to start a little bit from the context uh, and to think a little bit about Singapore, introduce you a little bit to Singapore and think a little bit about UK. And so what I did was I decided, OK, I'm just going to give kind of a broad view of where Singapore and the UK are. It takes about 15, 14 hours uh, direct flight from Singapore to the UK. And in case you can't see, and you really can't see it because it's not even on the map here, it's right at the tip of Singapore. And I have to put a little arrow to say Singapore is here. A little bit more so you see that little dot, there's Malaysia and Singapore is this small island right at the end. So that's the other Similarity that we have, we're both small islands and we have both transpired against the odds, you know, to take the wall by storm, whatever you call it. But we're both small islands, but small in a very different way. And this is what I mean by we are really, really small because I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's an outline of an island in the middle, like kind of in the middle of the map. And I'm not sure I can drive out of London and not drop off into the ocean. And that's how, just how small we are in Singapore. And I thought it was important to give the context as well, because I do know that many of the colleagues who are teachers, who are librarians, there's so much, you know, that you do to advocate for school libraries. And there's so many challenges to deal with. And for me, because I work in the Singapore context, one of the good things about it is that when the Ministry of Education is convinced that something needs to be done, there's going to, likely there will be more systematic action, but it takes a long while to convince them. And I think in that way, uh, there is that similarity as well. But because we're very small, we do we are able to see systemic action uh, happen much quicker. So back to the talk proper, uh, what I wanted to start off with was to think about kind of the background and looking at the PISA results. 
And one of the worrying things with the 2018 results, and I bring up the 2018 rather than a more recent uh, survey, was because uh, the 2018 PISA findings focus on reading specifically. And one of the things that they found in the 2018 survey when they compared it to the earlier study in 2009 was that there was an increase in the number of teenagers who reported that they didn't read in their leisure time. So from 40% to 50% of the teenagers. And there were more teenagers that said that they don't really enjoy reading as much and they only read if they have to. Now, against this backdrop, we kind of look at the lower primary, primary backdrop where in high performing countries such as Singapore and the UK, and there are more similarities here, we find that fewer students reported liking reading very much. They did very well for their studies, but fewer reported that they like reading. Uh, the other thing, though, was that pupils that like reading versus those that did not like reading actually did better in the poor system. So, you know, the fact that they like reading was actually something that was good for them. The other thing, and that's something that I'm really interested in, and that's, I think, where the social justice and equity comes in, is that we find that students who like reading had more books at home. And more recently, in uh, the analysis of some of the findings we have with our survey data in Singapore, we find the same thing as well. And what was really interesting was that they had more print books at home. And that actually kind of was associated with their reading enjoyment, which is associated with their reading proficiency as well. And this is um, a concern I know in the UK, and it is similar here. We, we don't have the category of free school meals, but we have this scheme called uh, students who are on financial assistance. So in my research, I look at students who are on financial assistance and define those as students who are disadvantaged but they were more likely to report that they do not like reading. And in the Singapore context, what we found was that during the pandemic where there was a physical school lockdown, so the students couldn't go to school for two full months, both in the primary school as well as in the secondary school, we found that students who were from higher socioeconomic status homes who had more books at home actually enjoyed reading more during the pandemic, whereas the students who didn't have as many books and didn't enjoy reading during the pandemic when they couldn't go to school, their reading enjoyment actually declined. And I think that makes a very strong argument for school being very important for the reading enjoyment of students who may not come from homes where they have all these reading resources. So now I think why school libraries uh, and many, I think I'm speaking to the converted here. So maybe I'm just kind of summarizing what you already know and hopefully I'll get into more specifics later. But in terms of the research, what the research tells us is that well-stocked and interesting school libraries are associated with reading enjoyment. So not just the presence of the school library. I think, of course, the school library, the presence of the school library is the most important. But on top of that, it needs to be well-stocked and interesting. We also know, and this is studies from Australia, that show that library visitation is associated with increased reading frequency and attitude. So students who visit the library more whether out of choice or whether enforced in the sense that there's a reading period, there is a tendency for them to read more frequently and to have more positive feelings about reading. School libraries are particularly important for low SES students as they offer access to books. Because they don't have as many books at home, the school libraries become particularly important. And for students who are on free school meals, um, the school library visits are associated with enjoyment of reading, confidence in their own reading and writing abilities, and frequency of reading for pleasure. And this comes from the research of Wood and from the uh, UK, um, from the National Literacy Trust studies. What else do we know? School libraries also encourage occasional readers. So school libraries are important for everybody, okay, but particularly for occasional readers, students who might not, you know, naturally want to pick up a book. School libraries are really important for them. And school librarians can actively support reading for pleasure in schools. And finally, school libraries are important for both primary and secondary school students. I think there is a tendency, and a lot of my work is in the secondary school space. 
The reason being that in the primary school space, there's almost an acknowledgement that school librarians, school libraries are very important because we want them to read a lot. So they, they get better at their reading, they enjoy reading. And when I started uh, my research in about 2016, 2015, 2016, it was almost like there was this belief that once children became teenagers and they went to secondary school, there was no need to pay any more attention to their reading. If they like reading, they would go to the school library. If they didn't, oh, well, you know, the school library didn't make a difference. But actually what I've found since is that school libraries are important for both primary and secondary school pupils. And finally, we go back to the idea that well-stocked design and equipped school libraries are more likely to be used. So moving into the details, actually, I just want to talk about these three advantages of school libraries before going into some examples, thinking about actual practices of school libraries to give suggestions about some areas that we can focus on and work on in terms of school libraries. But I'd like to suggest that there are actually three advantages for the school library compared to perhaps um, the public library. Of course, there are public libraries. I'm not sure about UK, but in Singapore, every student can get to a public library by public transportation within 30 minutes. And that's really not a very long time. And we've got ebooks as well. So it begs the argument, why then do we need school libraries? Can't we just channel our students to the public libraries? And I think actually school libraries do have three advantages and they're very distinct and very unique advantages. There's the proximity advantage, the familiarity advantage, and the social advantage. So the first advantage is the proximity advantage. And we see this with some of the students and with the teachers where they tell us that they go to the school library because it is in school. And this quote is from a library coordinator. Just to give you a little bit of, um, I suppose, background about the Singapore system, we don't have teacher librarians. It is not in the system. That's one of the things that I really wish for and that I'm advocating for. We have library coordinators. Library coordinators are teachers who have the additional role of managing the school library. Uh, in a school which is supportive, the library coordinator usually has a team of teachers to work with, but sometimes they're working on their own. But in one of the schools that we've been working with, uh, the library coordinator, who is very enthusiastic, and he says this, the school library can do what the public library can't. One of the things is really proximity. The school library is here. It's here. It's in school. You know, you walk by, you pass by, it, and because it is here, you can go in. You don't have to make that extra effort to travel to the library. Uh, in my own research, what we've also found when we look at the data is that students visit the school library more regularly and more often than public libraries. And this is especially so for students who are on financial assistance. So they use the libraries more than they actually use the public library. That's why the school library is important. It's here, it's there in school. I think the second point that the library coordinator brings up is that within the school, they are able to curate the collection and target them specifically towards the interests and needs of the students. Because the students are able, because the teachers or the librarians in the school know where the reading level of the children are, know where the interests are, they are able to have particular collection that will interest the students. And this actually leads me to my next point, which is the familiarity advantage. One of the things we realized uh, about school libraries when we started talking to students and public libraries is that the school library is actually a more familiar place, especially for students who are not familiar with school libraries, uh, with public libraries. What do I mean by that? Most of you here are probably very avid readers. And when you go to a public library, especially when it has lots of books, you go like, oh, Wow, what a lot of books, you know, uh, let me go get them. But for students who are not familiar with the public library, it is actually very intimidating because when you go in, you're not quite sure what to borrow. You're not sure where the comic section is. And this quote is particularly interesting because we interviewed the student and one of the questions we asked them is, do you prefer the public library or the school libraries? And the pattern that we observe is avid readers, they prefer the public library because they'll say, well, we like the public library because there are more books in the public library. 
But for other students who are not necessarily avid or who do not visit the library as often, doesn't mean they don't like reading. They might like reading, but they don't visit the public library as often. They tell us that the school library is more familiar. It makes them feel secure. And this particular student, Lupin, says it has comics I can read because his library has chosen to stock comics. And what is really interesting is that our public library stocks comics as well. But when we talked to him about the public library, he, he told us, you know, I can never find the comics. There's nothing in the public library that interests me. But I prefer the school library because it has the comics that I can read. And what we see students doing is just coming into the library, not necessarily borrowing the books, but just reading because with the comics, they can just kind of flip and then having that break and then moving off uh, to their next lesson because the library provides that space for them. So there's the proximity advantage and then linked to it is the familiarity advantage. The third advantage that I want to talk about is the social advantage. And that is the idea that they can go to the library with friends if they want to. And if you look at this quote, the student says, I usually come with my friends to go and read. We normally choose chairs over here. That's familiarity again, right? And this is the library. They've stocked it out with chairs that are kind of comfortable to sit in. And one of the things that they've done is made the chairs, uh, put the chairs back to back so that it's clearly an indicator that this is a reading space and not a talking space. But the students come here together with their friends and they sit down, they pick a book, maybe they have a very short chat and both of them, they are there, they are sitting and they're reading. So there is that social advantage in school where Students can go to the library together, where if friends are interested in reading, they can visit the library together. And if there are kind of teachers, library periods, teachers bringing them down to the library, they can be socialized into knowing what to read, how to read, and becoming familiar with books. So I think now I'm just going to move on to the idea of how school libraries can support reading for pleasure and draw on some of the research that I've done uh, to kind of explain how school libraries can support reading for pleasure. I see that there are questions in the chat and Helen's keeping track of them. So I will come back to them later. And I think there are comments too. So that's great. Please keep it going. Uh, but I think in terms of how school libraries support reading for pleasure, I have to firstly thank Teresa and Sarah who uh, McDowell from University of Edinburgh for inviting me to write a book chapter on school libraries and reading for pleasure. Because of that, Casey Garrison from Charles Stood and myself started looking uh, and reviewing uh, articles on school libraries. And Casey and I were working and looking at the chapters. And basically, this school library enablers comes from a chapter that's in progress with Casey. And basically, we've identified three um, categories that are very important for reading for pleasure when it comes to school libraries. The first category is collection and choice. The second category is the library environment. And the co third category is community support. So on to the first category, ca collection and choice. One of the things we found in reading the reviews and also in my own research is that students like to have choice in their reading. They like to be able to choose. They like to say, you know, if I like to read this book, I read this book. And I'm not sure about you guys, but I found that teenagers tend to be very clear about their reading. You know, I read mystery. I read thrillers, you know, so please find me more thrillers. I want to read more thrillers. And that, and they may branch out later, but they do have very specific reading tastes at particular time. But when it comes to the collection, one of the things that we've also found is that sometimes there are libraries, but because the collection is not interesting, that's why the students don't find the library interesting. So a high quality collection is definitely one of the first things that school libraries should work on. And a high quality collection includes interesting books. Now, what is interesting? We keep hearing this in the interviews uh, that we do with students in our research, but we also see it in the research that has been done by others. Kids keep asking for interesting books. And interesting books are basically books that they want to read. It's not books that we want them to read. Uh, 
so I think that is something to think about. So children's literature, young adult literature, series books, magazines, these are all interesting books. And it's possible to ask students what they find interesting so that you can see what is interesting. And if you ask me later, I'll also tell you what are some of the categories that are definitely interesting with young adults. I'll show you some examples from children about what they find interesting. I think a high quality collection should include both fiction and non-fiction. Although we know that there's a fiction effect, most kids like to read a lot of fiction, they also like to read non-fiction. The collection should be diverse, meaning although we want to have books that the students will read, we also want to have books that we think they might find interesting, books that are good, books for learning, include these books as well. And a high quality collection requires us to have the newest titles. So we need to keep reading, we need to keep looking to think about what kinds of books are important. Quality is important, and I think quality is the main thing. But having taken care of the quality, the number, the quantity matters as well. You know, to have the large number of books so that students are able to choose from that collection. The last point I want to put down here is print first, digital complementary. I know one question that I always get asked is, you know, we're short of funds, right? We have a limited fund uh, set of money. Should we just invest in digital? You know, kids are digital natives, supposedly. But what we've found in our surveys and in our interviews and all our research, and from research in Australia, we have the same thing. Children and teenagers actually prefer to read print uh, the avid readers tend to read in print and read digitally quite frequently. But when it comes to being able to find books, being able to flip and to kind of decide what to read, children actually prefer print. And what was interesting was that during the pandemic, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sun Bao Ti, she's she actually ran a survey, a similar survey. So she works with uh, young children and she works with bilingualism. I look at English reading and I tend to focus on adolescence. But one of the questions that she asked the children was during the pandemic, during that school closure, were you able to read digitally? And actually many of the students told her, you know, I don't know how to find books online. It's very hard to read digitally. There are paywalls. I prefer print, wall, uh, print books. And she coined the term print native to say that, well, actually, children do prefer to read print. They are print natives, and it's easier for them to find books. Uh, print first. So print first, digital complementary. Having said that, I think it's quite important to have a digital collection. Within the Singapore context, the public library actually has an e-book collection. So what we do is to manage the funding is we say we have to teach the students how to use the public library ebook system so that we can spend whatever little money we have on print books and then make use of the public library ebooks. So I'm going to show you a case study from an exemplary school library. This is actually Dalwich International School in Singapore. So I think it is an ideal school library, but we also know that they do have a lot of funding. So the support is quite a lot. But I think it helps to look at a, an, exemplary, an exemplary school library because it gives us the indicators of what is important. We begin to see one of the factors that make children read. So in Dalwich, Singapore, uh, when we did this uh, study, it is an international school and we were looking at years three to six, that is ages seven to 11, just exactly like the UK system. There was one qualified teacher librarian in this school library, along with two library assistants. And they had a 45 minute library period once a week. During this 45 minute library period, once a week, there would be borrowing, mini lessons, book promotion, information literacy skills. And the opening hours were done in such a way that the kids would always be able to access the library. And they had a print collection of over 16,000 titles, including large print, audiobooks, ebooks, and digital subscriptions. So a huge uh, print collection, and they do have huge loan rates as well. But I'm showing this not so much to talk about how much they have, but you know, we were able to make use of our study 
to actually look at what the students were reading, what was happening in an exemplary library. So when we look at the data and we look at what the students were reading, we began to see a pattern in terms of their changing tastes across the years. So if you look at year three, year four, year five, and year six, you will see these are the top books that they borrow in the different years. So I'm going to leave you to kind of glance over it while I have a sip. You can see the change from kind of more uh, picture-oriented, kind of, you know, there are more drawings, there's more comics, and then it moves to kind of more series books. But the series actually go through from year three to year six as well. But thicker books come in as well. But I think what is interesting is we asked students, one of the survey questions, we said, you know, like, how do you choose books? Why would you read books? Can you tell us the reason for that? And it's quite, so if you look at the reasons that they gave for the best title of the year, in year three, they like funny books, action and adventure books, relatable or familiar books. And then by year four, action and adventure kind of, well, still almost tight, but, you know, funny isn't as important. It's still important, you know, but action and adventure takes over. And then that's when interesting comes in, right? And learn, learning new information is something that's important as well. And then you move on to action adventure, interesting, mystery suspense, and then you've got mystery suspense. And in my own data, looking at uh, young adults, they start wanting books that make them think. They start wanting books that are exciting. Uh, and in this library, you can see how, again, the percentage of the collection, this is just for graphic novels and loans, where the teacher librarian made the decision to increase the collection to have more graphic novels, and that the graphic novels borrowed were actually proportionately much more than the other books. And that's why this decision making was made. So I just wanted to show you the illustration about the collection. The next thing I think that is important is the library environment. It came out quite strongly and very often we don't pay attention to the environment as much, but I think that there is a lot more in not just school libraries, but in the research on schools that's beginning to look at the environment and how the learning environment supports reading and learning. So with the students, a lot of them like a space that's welcoming and calm. Um, the second point was very interesting. It, came out in our research, but it also came out in some of the studies. They like the books to be organized for visibility and discoverability. So the organization of books, I see that as the library environment because it's about making the books visible and findable, and then they're more inclined to read that way. Um, they like comfortable reading furniture. They like having a choice of furniture, and they like having spaces for reading-related programming. Now, if you look at this picture on the right, you'll see these high back chairs. And it's really quite interesting because I was doing a design thinking workshop with some students uh, just about two days ago in their library, which they were going to renovate, right? And um, I kind of get them to think about what they want to see in their library. And they pointed to a bench uh, in the library and said, you look at the bench, nobody ever sits there to read. It's uncomfortable. There's no back. We need a back. I'm like, okay, so we really do need chairs with back. Benches may not work as well if we want to encourage reading. They're great for temporary stops to browse at shelves, but not as great for sustained reading. Note, again, the idea of visibility and discoverability. Uh, I'm not completely for... I, I do agree with genre kind of displays, and I think it's good to have genre displays. And I know in some schools, they've gone completely genre. In my own work with school libraries in Singapore, I tend to recommend a hybrid approach where I say, well, you still do your A to B shelves, but can we have a genre section? And that's partly to do with the system being unable to cope with the shelving and the circulation. But I think the genre approach is pretty good because what it does is actually it makes things visible. When you do front facing, students are attracted. It's like a shopping trip to the bookshop. But I think in addition to it, when we think about the kinds of labels we are using, it's a form of education as well. Because when the students walk into the library, they learn new things when they see these different possible labels. 
So here I'm going to give an example of how uh, one school library in one of future re ready school libraries I worked with, we actually uh, redesigned the whole library. And in this school, they said we want books to be at the center of our library. And what we did first was we said, okay, how many books should this library hold? This is just the first floor. So there's a second floor, which is more of a studying space. Okay, but they wanted the entrance, which is kind of at the bottom. When you look in, they wanted it to be books. They wanted to really encourage the girls in this school to read. So I asked, I said, how many books do you want? They said, we needed to have at least 15,000 books. So we work out, we asked the National Library for some recommendations. We worked out the number of shelves we need, we needed. And then the next thing we did in talking to the designer was, okay, let's think about where we want to put the books. So the first thing the school thought about was special display. They have some uh, special programs and they really wanted to have the special display. So that would be these circular, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's this circular section and there's actually a stage. Okay, And they wanted it to be surrounded with books. In the initial design, there were a lot more circular shelves but the school decided they couldn't afford it, but they said we would do this. We are going to do the circular because these are our feature shelves and it's going to showcase the books that we really want the students to see. It's going to be the first thing that people see when they come in. And then if you look to the right, that's where the fiction is going to be, you know, and there, there are some seats there, some quiet corners, and there were actually shelves built for front facing. Okay, and then the nonfiction over here closer to where the discussion ports were supposed to be. And then later they figured we'll just put the new arrivals where the fiction are at the very front shelves, uh, so that you know the kids can see it when they come in and we'll have some magazines. But I wanted to show you this floor plan because you know when we think about the learning environment, sometimes when we think about redesigning the library space, we kind of just Think about chairs, we think about furniture, but actually the bookshelves are really the most important things, whether they are built in or whether they are movable. And having this logic of wayfinding actually makes it easier for students to find books. I'll just show you an example. So when you hit in, that's the entrance and you can kind of see a bit of the shelf with the lighting by the side, um, the books there for students to find. Um, and this is actually the stage that I showed just now. And in this school, they wanted to do this area where they could actually, you know, have performances. They have uh, spoken word poetry. They invite people to come in to speak. You can sit about 40 to 50 students here. But the idea is that books would frame whatever they were doing. And again, this is the fiction section. Notice there isn't the special lighting here, you know, so that's where they were cutting the cost. But they still tried to make the science like fantasy, science fiction, make it very clear for the students. And actually, in the end, the library could fit about 20,000 books. So finally, the last thing is the idea of community support. Uh, I think in order for school libraries to work, uh, there needs to be leadership buy-in for school-wide reading for pleasure with the recognition that the library is at the center. We found that the teacher librarian is often seen as an enabling adult who is there to mediate what is happening in the library, recommend books to the students, designing activities, uh, coming up with games or um, coming up with programs to support the students' reading. And when schools actually have a teacher librarian, it actually helps with the students' uh, engagement. I think it allows that form of personalization or customization that teachers, because they are so busy themselves, might not be able to provide, even if they wanted to. Um, there have been examples of parent or community support, where basically uh, the national, in one study in New Zealand, which we looked at, uh, there was a reading program where the school library collaborated with the public library to actually have a collaboration to encourage the kids to do summer oh, okay. reading. Jamie, so, yeah. Um, what are some implications? Jamie, so maybe just to sum up, implications for practice. I think the school library is core for supporting students' reading in terms of access and building a reading culture. Uh, it is important for focusing on developing the reading. I mean, one of the important things that schools need to do is to focus on developing the library collection space 
and programming together. I'm quite sure many of you who are librarians here, you know how important the books are. But sometimes what has happened in the Singapore context is people kind of look at the pictures and they say, we're going to redo the space and they forget about the books. And But really the books are at the centre and the programming and the collection work together with the space. Manpower, um, can we have teachers or school librarians as enablers? And can we have more evidence-based practice where we collect evidence of what we do, a little bit like what we were doing at Dowich, perhaps a more simple way of collecting evidence so that we can advocate and we can share? What are the implications for policy? Uh, I think national funding and support is quite helpful. It's not always possible. And even in my work in Singapore, um, sometimes, you know, there is, there is uh, some policy impact, but then I'm not sure, is it enough in terms of the policy impact? So in my early research, I was told that uh, because of the research that uh, we had done, the book, the book fund for each student was increased from three Singapore dollars to five Singapore dollars. And I thought that's still not enough to buy a book. But then I said, let's look at it, glass half full. They have more money now. So, you know, I think we have to work with the national funding and support. Uh, I think there's a better, there's need to better translate research into policy and practice where, you know, with a lot of the work that we do, we need to think about how it can be applied and maybe how we can share it and how we can communicate with policymakers. There needs to be advocacy for school libraries and for librarians in my context, particularly for librarians. And I think we need to evaluate, evaluate and evaluate. And this ties in with the need for evidence-based research because we need to see if things are working. We need to document if things are working because with that, then we can make policy change because we have the evidence to say something is working. And I think we also need to be brave to admit if something is not working or to say, well, it's not working, but let's try something else and then to be tenacious and to figure out, hey, actually, if I tweak it this way, it will work, but not in the original way that I envisage. Um, I'll drop the links to this tool in the chat later, but in some of my work, these are just two examples of um, what I call more public-friendly or teacher-friendly uh, reports that I've done. The first is a report, the Design Patterns for School Libraries. It's a report of um, how to build a reading culture, but it's about designing school library spaces. So I'll drop that in the chat later. On the right was something that I did for the Ministry of Education in Singapore, which is just a very quick kind of postcard guide to what are some quick things you can do just to improve the display, the development and display of your collection. So I'll drop that in the chat as well. So finally, I think this is my last slide, some suggestions for research for those of you who are thinking about research. I think we need to pay attention to young people's diverse reading interests across print and digital mediums and different platforms. Remember, I started with saying that, you know, we've got these large scale research that say that that tell us that kids are not reading as much or not enjoying reading as much. You know, on the one hand, I think, yes. Maybe that's true and we need to pay some attention to that. But I think on the other hand, we need to recognize that it's very complex and that they may not be reading as much or they may be reading just as much some other way. So we need to find out. We need to find out what are their interests. We need to find out what they're reading, even while keeping in view this idea that, hey, they are not reading as much as they're used to. But let me see what other things they are reading and how can I encourage them to read more and how can I encourage to read uh, a different range of literature and how can I encourage different groups of young people because they do have different profiles and there may be different needs. So I think there needs to be a lot more attention on young people's diverse reading interests and needs. There needs to be a lot more action research, localized evidence-based studies that take context into account um, to say, why is it in this context we need more of this or that? And that ties into the idea of evaluation and evidence-based studies. 
I do think I'm increasingly convinced that teachers' and librarians' knowledge of children and young adult literature are very important. I think Suiza has a book uh, all about uh, teachers and li teachers' uh, subject knowledge. And I know in your work, you've been talking about, you know, the subject knowledge that is required. I think librarians, uh, for them, it's more in their DNA. It's like they know they need to know about children and young adult literature but we don't have librarians in school. So that's part of the complex problem we have there. You know, uh, teachers need to have more knowledge. They don't have the time, but it should be part of their subject knowledge. Librarians tend to have the knowledge, and but we don't always have them in every school. So I do think that we need more research in this area about professional development. And finally, a lot of where my research is, is about developing reading environments that can support reading for pleasure. How can we change this space? What is it that we can do in classrooms that can, and in libraries that can actually encourage reading? What works are, what are people doing? And those are the important things I think that we need to look at. And maybe I'll just leave with this quote. I think, you know, uh, in the absence of interesting texts, very little is possible. So I think what can we do as school, in school libraries and school librarians, I think it is our job to get interesting texts into the hands of students. And really that's one of the most important thing that school libraries and librarians do. So with that, thank you very much.